My name is Hamid, and in today's discussion, we'll be covering motor neuron disease. A famous example of motor neuron disease is the diagnosis of Stephen Hawking with ALS, and remarkably, he was diagnosed at the age of 21, and he is still alive with the condition. So what is motor neuron disease? Motor neuron disease is a condition that results in progressive loss of motor neurons. It's a rare group of disorders, and it can have a mixed upper and lower motor neuron features. There are several subtypes, and a couple of them that I'll be discussing are included in this episode. So we have amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, and that's the most common cause of adult onset motor neuron disease. You can have primary lateral sclerosis, which is rare, it's idiopathic, and it predominantly presents with upper motor neuron features, and has a later onset and less lethal compared to ALS, with variable disability. You can also have progressive bulbar palsy, which is a degenerative disease affecting medullary motor nuclei. It predominantly affects cranial nerves 9, 10, and 12, and the degeneration can eventually become widespread like ALS. And finally, spinal muscular atrophy is another interesting subtype, where you get characteristic degeneration of the spinal lower motor neurons. When it comes to pathogenesis, the etiology of motor neuron disease is not clear, but appears to be multifactorial. There are possibly genetic risk factors, which may dictate how susceptible patients are to neuronal damage. 5-10% to 10% of ALS happens to be familial, so they can be related to the SOD1 mutation, for example, c 9 orf 72 gene, or TARD-BP mutation as well. The role of environmental factors is not clear, Pathogenesis may include glutamate exotoxicity, oxidative neuronal damage, and mitochondrial dysfunction. Glutamate may cause an increased availability and disruption of calcium homeostasis, which then leads to neuronal death. What you also tend to see is a ubiquinated cytoplasmic inclusion in the exons affected of those nerves. And these protein aggregations may be somehow involved with pathogenesis, although again, the rule is not clear. An interesting finding in spinal muscular atrophy is the fact that a gene called survival motor neuron gene dysfunctions, and the dysfunction of this gene results in continued programmed cell death of the neurons. Moving on to signs and symptoms. What are those signs and symptoms? Well, with focus on ALS, which represents, as I mentioned, a mixed picture, you can have upper motor neuron signs where patients present with spasticity and hyperreflexia, and they can also have lower motor neuron signs, so they can have fasciculation, muscle weakness, and atrophy, and they can have difficulty with fine motor skills. What's interesting is that rectal and bladder sphincter and ocular muscles are spared. Symptomatic progression occurs within the first area of and then eventually adjacent contiguous regions may become involved and the rate of progression can be quite variable. It's worth noting that sensory neurons are spurred in this condition. Patients, as I mentioned earlier, can have bulbar signs so they can present with dysarthria where they have impairment of mouth, tongue or pharynx. This results in spurred or poorly articulated speech although there is no issues with language centers in these patients. They can have swallowing difficulties or dysphagia. They can have muscle weakness and atrophy and sensor neural hearing loss may be part of the presentation. So when it comes to diagnosis, it's important to consider other potential causes of these symptoms. You have to rule out vitamin B12 deficiency with subacute combined degeneration of the cord. Patients may present with stroke and have these similar symptoms. Uh, Rule out nerve root compression, myelopathy such as infectious causes, HIV, TB and syphilis, and cervical myelopathy. Some features that are not normally consistent with ALS include sensory involvement, neuropathic pain, or cognitive impairment. Although some patients can have mild cognitive impairment at the time of presentation. So in terms of investigations, the key role of investigations is to rule out the other possible causes. You can have needle electron myography or EMG, and in patients with ALS, you can expect some fibrillation and fasciculation potentials. There can be reduced motor neuron recruitment and the loss of motor neurons that engage their respective muscle groups. Nerve conduction studies can be employed to rule out other causes such as peripheral neuropathy, and sensory studies are expected to be normal in patients with motor neuron disease. Some laboratory tests that you can consider include folate and vitamin B12 levels, HIV and syphilis screen if it's appropriate, and imaging studies such as CT or MRI can be used to rule out neurological lesions or cord compressions, and you don't expect to see any abnormal findings in ALS patients. When it comes to treatment, pharmacological treatment and non-pharmacological treatments both play an important role. An agent that can be prescribed in motor neuron disease is Rilazole, and the mechanism of action of this drug is not clear, although it's been shown to modestly improve survival by a median of two to three months. It's believed to act on the glutamate pathway as an antagonist, inhibiting the activities of kinate and NMDA receptors, and possibly play a role on sodium channels, although its activity and function is not clear. Symptom control is also important. So in patients who present with limb stiffness and spasticity, baclofen can be prescribed. For patients with depression and anxiety, the use of SSRIs may be warranted. And those with hypersalivation, the use of drugs with anticholinergic properties such as atropine and amitriptyline can be considered. 
Non-pharmacological approaches are very important. So in patients with dysphagia and appetite loss, dietitian input and high calorie diets may be a worthwhile goal to pursue and cake feeding can be considered. Ventilatory support can be considered and ventilatory support has been shown to improve survival and improve the patient's quality of life. Rehabilitation and uh, input from allied health is very important. It's important to ensure that patients are safe to go home and they have necessary home modifications to ensure that they live a quality and meaningful life. It's also important to get allied health and occupational therapy involvement to ensure patients can maintain their mobility and muscle strength for as long as possible. And as you can imagine, disease of this nature can have significant psychological impact on the patient, so the use of psychotherapy and psychology input is important. The prognosis of motor neuron disease is not great. The median survival is three years from clinical onset or weakness. However, as has been demonstrated with the case of Stephen Hawking, longer survival can occur. Prognosis is better, younger age of onset, male gender, and limb symptoms at the onset of disease. Death typically occurs as a consequence of respiratory failure. So this sums up motor neuron disease. I hope you found this topic and episode useful. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know by contacting us through our website, through YouTube, and Twitter.